Okay, hi everyone. Back for another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And we have a variety of questions left over from last week, which I thought I would start with. So let's see, we have one from Parmenides here. Who are your favorite science fiction authors? What are your favorite stories and movies? You know, I am a terrible reader of fiction. I, it, it's one of those things where I keep on saying, uh, later in life, I'll read fiction, but I never get around to it. I did read some science fiction when I was a kid, and I was not, wasn't always so thrilled with it because I was always interested in, you know, what are the key ideas about the world, the future, whatever, uh, from the science fiction. It's like, give me, let me take this 50 page uh, story. I just want to compress it to the one page, which is this is the idea about the future. And I wasn't at that time so interested in the kind of human story. I have to say that in more modern times, the whole question about how humans interact with technology in the future and so on, I find much more interesting. And I think there's, uh, there's a lot that can and should be explored in science fiction about the way that uh, we think about the human condition, its relationship to kind of our digital, the digital analog of humans, our relationship to AI, these kinds of things. And I think there's there's a lot that can be explored where where to write it as a as a as something written as sort of philosophy um, would be much harder to understand than writing it as something more like a story. But having said that, I can talk about a few things that a few sort of science fiction kinds of things that I found uh, interesting or, or whatever. I think the first, um, uh, probably the first, well, mostly movies rather than books. Um, the first one that uh, uh, certainly had a, an effect on me was 2001, A Space Odyssey, which came out in 1968. Um, and actually it happened to be the, the very first movie that I saw in an actual movie theater. Uh, but um, that's, that's neither here nor there. But, um, you know, 2001 is interesting, was interesting to me at the time for its very sort of bright vision of the future. And, and really it was a mixture of a story about space and a story about computers. And I went back and looked at it uh, back a couple of years ago now at its, uh, at its uh, 50th anniversary to try and sort of analyze the movie and um, uh, what was in it and what was significant about it. I mean, I think that um, uh, in a sense, the, um, the human characters in the movie, which I kind of respond to much more now than I did when I was eight years old or whatever, um, uh, are, are kind of interesting for being uninteresting, so to speak. Uh, the AI, the computer, the HAL 9000 is, um, uh, is in a sense, one of the most human characters in the, in the whole movie. But, you know, there were, there were themes in that movie that I thought were interesting about kind of the, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of large span of time from sort of the earliest uh, 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 interest in sort of science by kind of the, the, the hominid pre-human ape-like creatures at the beginning of the movie, uh, you know, flowing through to kind of the, the, uh, the future of the extraterrestrials and so on um, at the end of the movie. And I think also uh, it was it was interesting to see you know that was a place where I could kind of see uh, at least a vision for what uh, computer technology of the future might look like. It was interesting to look at it 50 years later and see what was gotten right, what was gotten wrong. I mean, there were a lot of very interesting mistakes. Like for example, one of them is the idea of of soft windows on the screen just wasn't there. So for them, different functionality was a different physical screen with different doing different kinds of things the idea of, of, of sort of everything as software wasn't really there um, and uh, there were uh, you know that the, the, was a very um, uh, talk to your computer type um, type movie now you know in a sense some of the things that, that I've done in, in developing software technology have been things that have sort of filled out uh, some of the things that were kind of anticipated in a movie like that about sort of be able to ask your computer questions and have it give meaningful answers, um, things like this. But um, that, that was, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's also kind of charming in that movie, 
um, there's, uh, you know, you're talking to the computer. There's no notion of, of any kind of computational language that the computer is using or that anybody is using to sort of be precise. There's a certain amount of, of human precision language that sounds like, you know, air traffic control lingo. Um, that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the taking natural language and making it more precise, just like a legal contract would make things more precise. Um, but it didn't get to the point of understanding that there would be sort of a computational language that would be a bridge between the human and the computer. And there are just a few brief moments where screens flash up essentially computer code, which is sort of a charming mixture of mathematical notation. And I think an early version of the PL1 computer language that uh, IBM developed. IBM was sort of the main consultant for that movie in terms of, of computer technology. But so that's, that's an example of a movie I, I thought was interesting. I think... Um, Oh gosh! In more recent times, I just there's there's lots of them. I I I am uh, hasn't happened so much during this pandemic, but um, uh, usually I kind of make a point of I don't watch any television, but I do try and see a movie every week or two as a way to sort of keep in touch with uh, what's happening in the world in general. Um, but other science fiction movies I might mention. Another one I I thought was um, uh, was interesting was the Contact. Um, maybe there's a theme here of, of extraterrestrial movies um, between 2001, which is ultimately an extraterrestrial first contact movie, and uh, Contact, which is an extraterrestrial first contact movie, and uh, movie I, I help with a bit, Arrival, which is another extraterrestrial first contact movie. Um, I suppose uh, uh, Contact, I thought, was an um, uh, interesting movie. I, I you know, it, it portrays... Um, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, was somewhat realistically portrayed version of uh, kind of what it would be like for uh, humans to get an intelligible signal from extraterrestrials and what the kind of human response to that would be and um, how one would kind of uh, uh, understand what it was and a little bit of the human story behind sort of a discovery in, in, in science. Um, I'm trying to think. There are so many other science fiction movies from the um, uh, very, um, you know, some, sometimes movies will have a particular idea in them, like, uh, you know, Minority Report, which I'm not sure is a particularly, um, uh, wasn't particularly a movie that especially resonated with me in, in many ways, but, you know, its whole sort of gesture-based interface was something that became a, um, uh, a very... Um, uh, notable feature of that um, of that movie. Um, it's always interesting when when um, uh, you know the, there's always a question of, of to what extent are there really sort of science, technology, etc. Ideas in movies. To what extent are movies really human stories? And I think to, to a large extent, movies to be successful have to be human stories. If they're movies about um, uh, you know people like watching movies and find interesting movies, which are ultimately about people, perhaps people portrayed in a setting where they're, you know, traveling on a spacecraft to Jupiter or something, uh, rather than being in uh, uh, just, just hanging out, um, you know, in, in, in their, uh, you know, suburban setting or whatever. Um, but still, it's, it's got to be a story about people. Um, and in a sense, some of the stuff that I find most intellectually interesting is, uh, the places where sort of that intersects with technology and, and science and so on. Um, and uh, uh, the, um, uh, so, so sometimes those, those pieces are, are very much kind of extracted from, um, from the main part of the movie. Um, let's see, I think um, uh, if people want to ask about um, uh, particular movies, I could probably give some more analysis, but um, uh, it's a, it's at least a, a, a rough thing. So let's see, someone is asking here, Crunchy is asking, why do people have emotions and feelings? How do emotions and feelings work, like happiness and anger and so on? It's an interesting question. It's not completely known, but in a sense, emotions seem to be sort of a global setting about the brain. Like, a lot of what we do when we talk about things, when we think about very specific things, they're very specific, detailed uh, aspects of uh, of what we're thinking about. You know, we might, uh, uh, and they and they involve very elaborate, probably very detailed patterns of 
of activity in our brains, patterns of electrical activity in our brains. When we think about some uh, math problem or something, we're probably dealing with some very elaborate pattern of, of uh, electrical firings in our brains that represent those kinds of thoughts and so on. When we're just like, I'm happy, I'm sad, whatever else, that seems to be a much more global thing in our brains. And I think the, the, the general belief is that those more global things are associated with sort of a, a, a whole wash of chemicals, uh, neurotransmitters typically through our brains, rather than something which is a more detailed pattern of electrical activity in some particular region of our brains. And I think that um, uh, that's, that's why kind of um, various kinds of drugs and things can have an effect on sort of emotional state, uh, probably more so than they, than, you know, you don't take a, um, a drug that specifically uh, lets you learn, you know, how to do integrals and in calculus or something. Um, it's uh, so, so they tend to, uh, th these things that have sort of a global chemical effect on our brains. Now, you know, to what extent, how does that actually work? How does it translate from the uh, a neurotransmitter that makes it more likely for certain nerves to, uh, uh, neurons to fire or whatever else? How does that translate into a feeling of I'm happy? I don't think we really know that. The one thing that we, we do know, uh, it's something that's been realized, for example, Charles Darwin noticed this, is that the expression of emotions between sort of humans and, and animals is, is somewhat similar. I mean, even, you know, even the kind of the, the mouth, you know, the, the smile, the growl, or whatever else, similar between, you know, humans and dogs or whatever. Um, it's, um, uh, and so it seems like there's this kind of global mechanism this sort of emotional communication, emotional state that exists not just in humans, but also across a wide range of, of animals, at least in mammals. Um, and I think that uh, uh, that's, you know, for example, if we, you know, there was a, a thing a long time ago, I'm really surprised that it hasn't been more work done on this, of sort of the human dog communication process. And, you know, what can your dog be saying? You know, woof, woof, whatever else. Um, the, there's an extent to which one can, you know, rather than the dog saying, you know, I just figured out the solution to this equation, which is very unlikely probably for a dog to be saying, it's like, I'm a happy dog, I'm an unhappy dog, I'm a hungry dog, perhaps, whatever else. And, and these things are, are things where they're sort of more global features of the, of the state of the brain of the dog that uh, come out in uh, in sort of verbalizations, vocalizations that um, uh, one can more readily translate into something. And, and by the way, the concept of I'm happy, I'm sad, whatever else, seems to even transcend different species. Um, and there's a, at least a certain extent to which that's something where it's probably the same neurotransmitter that is, uh, that is representing these kinds of things. Now, you know, when we talk about emotional states, um, it's sort of interesting to, to ask a question, can we, can we sort of define a space of emotional states? Just like we can say, I don't know, um, uh, something that's, that's often done these days is um, with computers is so-called sentiment analysis. So you read a piece of text, it's you know, a review of some product somewhere. And the question is, is this a positive review or is it a negative review? What is the sentiment of this review? Does the person say, this product is just fantastic. This product is a piece of garbage. You know, these are, you can, you can rate those on different sort of sentiment scales. And so there's a question, uh, just like you can rate sort of the sentiment, it's, it's kind of going from happy with the product to sad with the product or something. It's kind of defining an emotional state with respect to, let's say, that product. Can you... Uh, can you do the same kind of thing? Can you define a kind of a space of from from happy to sad, from from angry to to content, from this to that, and and there are a variety of things over the last probably hundred years, and it was particularly popular, oh probably in the early part of the twentieth century, to try and make up these emotion spaces, which were kind of a representation of these different sort of things where you choose it's a it's 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 in one direction or it's another direction you know where are you in this sort of emotion space and i think it's quite possible that the, the people found these sort of emotion spaces that have maybe three four five parameters from uh, you know alert to you know completely not paying attention 
to this, to that, to the other. And I think there's at least a chance that those different parameters correspond very directly to levels of different neurotransmitters in our brains. And that, that, that really is a, a pretty direct way to understand, you know, how alert are we? How this are we? How, how, how that are we? So, but I think it's, a, it's a, an interesting thing to the extent to which, for example, when we have verbal communication, you know, we got words, you say certain words, they have certain implied kind of emotional content. You look at facial expressions, they have a certain implied emotional content. Same with, with voice, uh, the quality of voice timbre, things like that, have a certain implied emotional content. To what extent to, can you roll back and say, what is the, the underlying emotional thing that's going on in the brain? And to what extent do you take the words that are said and then have sort of this overlay of emotional state? You know, some human languages have a much more elaborately tonal and things than for example, English is. And I think the, you know, the, the, there's, there's a certain, there are certain extra levels of communication that one can expect which communicate various kinds of things, sometimes content there, but also potentially emotionally emotional state. So that's a, but I mean, if, if you ask the question, you know, the question was asking, why do people have emotions and feelings? Um, uh, you know, that, that's a, there's always a, it's always a difficult question in biology, why? Because, you know, the one thing we know about biology is if an organism is a particular species of organism dies out, then we're not even talking about that species. So the important thing in biology is for a species to keep going. And the fundamental way that any modern species keeps going is sort of have more children, so to speak. Um, I say modern because back in, you know, very early species didn't, didn't really have this notion of, of cycles of life and death and generations and so on. But, but for the last couple of billion years, probably maybe at least billion years, it's been sort of a story of, you know, kind of uh, have more offspring um, uh, to, to be a successful species, so to speak. So, so often in biology, there's sort of these questions about uh, how does some attribute of, of a biological system uh, have, a, have an effect on, uh, on improving your, your propensity, your likelihood of having offspring, on improving your fitness to have offspring and so on. And it's sort of an interest, it's, all, it's often interesting to go back and see, you know, can you figure out what aspect of this thing that is a feature of biological organisms helps in, you know, why does it help in having more offspring? Now, sometimes people get very confused because they look for that, but it turns out that's not what's going on. It turns out that the feature of the biological organism is just a consequence of how the organism grows or, or some other a piece of, of the development of the organism that has nothing to do with fitness. It, it really is just a sort of side effect of, of the way that the organism has to sort of grow its, its uh, uh, you know, ha has to uh, grow out the, the, the horn that it's growing or something. It has, to, it has to have this feature because that's sort of just the way horns grow, so to speak. Um, so, I, you know, in terms of emotions and so on, interesting question. I don't, I don't immediately see, um, I'm not sure I can immediately describe. Uh, I mean, there's probably things in, um, um, uh, you know, it probably depends a bit on, on how the organism works with respect to, uh, you know, is it, is it a very um, herd-like organism or is it a loner type organism? You know, there are different, uh, um, you know, things, you know, hunt in packs or they're lone wolves or whatever. Um, I think those wolves tend to be in packs, which is why you identify sort of the lone wolf idea. But there are other kinds of organisms that, like cats, for example, that tend to be very, uh, you know, one creature for itself, so to speak, rather than we're just going to, you know, have a have a big pack um, that we're that we're existing in. I suspect that emotions have um, uh, have a role in the way that kind of. Um, uh, things work in packs. I suspect also they have a role in the way that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, one very direct one will be, uh, for mammals at least, will be sort of taking care of the young, so to speak. And, oh, that's such a cute little creature, you know, let's take care of it, so to speak. That's sort of an important thing for, uh, for the survival of the species. If you expect to have, uh, you know, if you expect to have organisms which sort of get born where sort of the baby phase 
isn't very sophisticated and the baby phase can't fend for itself, then you have to make sure that the parents sort of take care of the offspring until it gets to the point where it can uh, uh, sort of um, uh, leave the nest, so to speak, and go off and fend for itself. So anyway, a few, a few thoughts about um, uh, origins of um, emotions. I, I think an interesting question I don't know the answer to is how low on the, on the chain of life you see emotional responses. You certainly see them in mammals. Um, I don't know if you see them. I'm trying to think. If you, do you see them in birds? Well, you see birds chirping, chirping, chirping happily. Um, whether, they, uh, whether one can identify clear emotional responses there, I do not know. I mean, I, I don't really, I, I've never really heard of anybody talking about um, a sad fish, so to speak. That doesn't seem to be a thing. Um, uh, you know, that there are sort of other attributes of organisms that are sort of global brain attributes, like sleeping, for example, which does happen in fish. Um, but I don't know of emotional states of, of things like fish. Um, so that's a, a good question. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there's a question here. I noticed just, um, uh, um, wow, all kinds of comments here. Um, the... Uh, as a question from um, uh, William, in the space of all possible mental states, what is the ratio of positive versus negative states? Is this a relative quantity? Does it obey transformations? Interesting question. I mean, I, I you know, look, uh, my personal observation about us humans is that many of us get sort of thrown a random thing, which is our sort of average mental state. You know, I'm and I'm happy about it, so to speak. I'm generally a pretty, you know, I'm in a pretty, I'm, I'm a pretty happy mental state kind of person. And, and yet, you know, even when really good things happen, that's, you know, it doesn't, it's okay, it's great, but it doesn't really make my mental state go much up. When bad things happen, no, it's, it's bad, but it doesn't make my mental state go much down. And, you know, I, I, I know plenty of people just as a, as a matter of sort of human experience, where it's like they're sort of always happy, they're always sad. And they can be always sad, even if fantastically good things happen to them, they're still somehow always sad. And that, that's, I think it's, it's you know, one, perhaps one just, uh, you know, one gets used to a certain mental state and, and maybe, I don't know whether my, you know, maybe I've just chosen to call the mental state that I have a sort of a, a generally happy mental state. And maybe to the outside, it would be like, oh, that person is just grinding tenaciously on the work they're doing and they don't seem happy at all. But to me internally, at least, it seems like it's like, okay, great. You know, things are good, so to speak. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a little bit in the, in the um, uh, maybe in the eye of the beholder, what counts as positive versus negative. I think, you know, when, when people do experiments on rats and so on, they often try to assign mental states to rats. Oh, this rat in this particular setting is, you know, it's a depressed rat. Um, because why is it a depressed rat? It kind of hangs out in the corner of the maze and it refuses to do anything. Or it's a very, uh, you know, um, a very excited rat. It's going to explore the maze in a, in a, in a very excited way. I mean, I, I would say that there probably are measurements that can be made for humans um, that uh, of sort of mental states. And I, I, you know, I didn't mention this earlier, but but as we know more sort of personal analytics data about ourselves, there are things that one can certainly measure. I mean, one can certainly measure not only the the sentiment of oh, I'm typing wonderful email, you know, t talking about how terrific the world is, or Another thing is, you know, you look at your sort of social network and you're asking, are you connecting out to lots of people? Now that's to some extent a, am I an extrovert? Am I an introvert? Um, or am I like, I have been connected out to a lot of people, but I'm really retracting and not talking to anybody. And that's kind of probably a sign that, that um, your, you know, your sort of mental state is, is going more to the, in the negative direction. But, um, uh, you know, and I, I do tend to think that in the, in sort of assessing mental states and so on, it's kind of like if, if you're uh, trying to, you know, help somebody understand their psychological state and so on, it's um, at least the way of the future is, okay, you know, can you give me the last year of social media communication? Let's go analyze what, what happened here. And, you know, do you, what can you tell from that about what's going on? But I don't think, um, uh, yeah, so somebody else commented here that um, if people didn't have emotions, then nothing would ever get done. That's interesting. That's that's that may very well be true. If um, uh, you know, I, I think there's a 
there's a certain tendency in, and it's identified not just in, in humans of, you know, are you interested in going out and exploring and going and, you know, uh, and, and finding new things? Or are you more like just, I want to nest and, and be sort of uh, be comfortable, so to speak. And I think those are, you know, that's, a, that's one of these sort of set points of, for different people and different times of, of life and so on that, um, uh, that, that one notices. Um, but I, I think, uh, um, you know, and so, sometimes there are, uh, I mean, it's always an interesting question. What, what is it, that, you know, the motivation that people have to do things is, is often very complicated to understand. It often has to do with their own history, you know, their interactions with other people and so on. And I suppose it's the case that in general terms, if, if nobody felt anything, then quite possibly that they just wouldn't, they wouldn't feel motivation either. And, um, uh, and so as, as, uh, as uh, Kat was saying here, um, then nothing would ever get done. The question here from Dan, do you think the set of emotions is finite? That's a very interesting question. Is it possible for evolution to bring a new kind of emotion or can we artificially create a new kind of emotion? I think it's a, that's a very interesting question. I think that insofar as it's true that emotions are associated with actual neurotransmitters in our actual brains, we're probably stuck with what we have. Um, I mean, you, know, you could ask the question, you know, if you have some, some bizarre drug, it's probably not a, not a great idea because, you know, brains have been involved for a long time and throwing something, some other random thing in is probably a super bad idea. But um, you could say, you know, can you, can you develop something which, is, uh, which would sort of affect our brains in a way that is very different from the way that our existing neurotransmitters do it or whatever else? Um, or is there a a sense in which, I mean, you know, the thing that always strikes me, uh, you know, with respect to the human condition and, uh, and things like human emotions and so on, you know, you go, you watch a, a play written by some ancient Greek playwright and the things that are going on are at a human level so absolutely identical to the kinds of things that go on today. It's clear that over the span of those few thousand years and all those changes in technology and culture and so on, nothing has changed really in the core of the human condition. And I think there's a, there's a sort of an interesting question, what can change in, uh, in sort of the core of the human condition and, and in things like uh, kind of the possibility for different emotions. I mean, like for example, let's imagine that we had a really close link between our brains and some digital device, some very close neural connection where some digital device was reading out lots of aspects of what we're thinking in our brains and feeding back, you should do this, you should do that. I mean, it, it, it's potentially a, a quite, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a very difficult to parse out. Is this good? Is this bad? Is this absolutely disastrous? Um, I mean, there's certainly settings in which that could be, and, and certainly science fiction has covered some of these in which that notion of the sort of externally engineered uh, kind of um, way of getting people to think things is absolutely disastrous. It's bad enough kind of uh, uh, sort of persuade, trying to persuade people of things by education, telling them the world works this way, the world works this way, the world works this way, doesn't matter what you think, you're, you're being told the world works this way. But if that's something that is directly being inserted directly into your thought process in your brain, that's yet a different uh, you know, uh, thing that, that has the potential for, for uh, uh, sort of bad ends to history, so to speak. But I think that the, um, uh, you know, the sort of a question of assume that you could sort of feed into the brain all sorts of things in response to external stimuli. Could you do that in a way that was, was very different from the way that happens right now and that we would read as sort of a different emotion? Uh, interesting question. I mean, I tend to think, so here's a, here's a way to think about that perhaps. In our sort of higher cognitive processes, the main way we express those is through language. You know, people invent some new concept, you know, the idea of a live stream or something, um, and that becomes a word in our language, then we get to talk in terms of it. People get to, you know, build sort of a stack of ideas about that and so on. Um, but as time goes on, language evolves and we end up with, with different kinds of concepts, different levels of abstraction that we express in language. So far as I know, that has not happened with human emotions. So far as I know, the, um, and maybe I'm wrong, but, but um, so far as I know, unlike language, 
which is this thing that is progressively building over the course of civilization. Human emotions haven't worked that way. And, and perhaps it's no surprise that emotions are also things shared with other animals and uh, which don't have the same kind of ability to, or don't appear to have the same kind of ability to sort of build with language progressively through generations and sort of build up the civilization of the cats or something. Um, and uh, so, so I think it's, it's, um, it is an interesting question whether there is a, a sort of language of emotions that can be more, more elaborate than, um, uh, but I think perhaps the other point is with language, we get to communicate one generation to the next. We get to communicate ideas. I'm not sure we do that really with emotions. I'm not sure that that's, a, that's the same type of communication that can happen um, in, in that way. Um, anyway, these are interesting questions. Um, let's see, there's a question here. Um, there's a question here from Jake. Uh, Given that our brains are most likely the source of, of everything, yeah, I think that's a good, a good assumption. Is there a finite set of combinations of matter in the brain? Could there be a finite set of all possible thoughts? Yeah, it's finite, but it's really, really big. And, and the thing to understand is about sort of combinations of things. It's like, how many possible passwords can you have on your, you know, let's say you've got a, a, a 10 letter password. How many possible passwords can you have? It's a really lot. It's probably, is it more than the number of atoms in the universe, uh, 10 letters? Uh, can't work that out instantly. I have to type it in to, to know that, but it'll be comparable at least. Um, and uh, I think that the, um, the thing to understand is that when you have even a fairly small number of possible uh, of items, each one of which can, can, can work differently, the total number of combinations is very big. It's just like with music, you know, you're playing on a piano, maybe there are 88 notes altogether, but maybe there are, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 notes that you, you would commonly use. But the set of possible musical pieces is absolutely immense. And um, it's, it's so immense that, you know, in the history of the universe, uh, you know, if, if one had been playing these pieces, uh, you know, all the pieces, you know, in the, uh, across the history of the universe, we wouldn't even be close to, to having exhausted all of them. So the thing to understand is when there are, when there are, when there are lots of independent things that get picked, uh, the, the total set of possibilities is really huge. So when it comes to brains, you know, we might have, oh, on the order of 100 billion neurons in our brains, maybe, um, uh, maybe some number of trillions of connections between neurons, and each one of those connections might be in one of, uh, of thousands of states. Um, and then if you work out sort of what does that mean? What is the total? It's a thousand to the trillion or something. That's an incredibly huge number. That's a number so big that in certainly in the history of our universe, we are, we're, not even, we're not even close to beginning to you know, take a little bite out of, of all of those possibilities. So the fact that it is in principle finite is, is not a, a useful statement in terms of saying, oh, you could only think about these number of things. Now, now there's some organisms that have many, many fewer neurons in their brains. Like for example, one organism studied a great deal as a little critical, the nematode, the C. elegans, and it has about, um, altogether, um, it has, uh, um, uh, let's see, 1700 cells, I think, of which about a few hundred are in its nervous system. So it has a, you know, a, a small number of neurons and um, you can kind of see for all of its neurons, you, people know to some extent, what does that neuron do? By the way, unlike us, when, when our brains form, neurons go to, you know, the ones that are gonna make our visual cortex go roughly to the back of our heads, the ones that are gonna make different parts of our brain go roughly to different places, but we're not, we're not specifically wired in a particular way. If you're a C. elegans with only a few hundred neurons, then you're wired in a very specific way. Like this particular neuron is connected to this particular tentacle and it does this particular thing. This particular neuron is connected to some, you know, smell sensor. And if it detects this, then it does that. It's much more of a, a special purpose piece of hardware than, than our brains are. Um, but, uh, you know, you could ask a question, I mean, for, for a creature like that, uh, you know, how many brain states does it get into? That's a much more finite number, and that's probably an answerable thing. 
um, you know, by the time you're at an ant, I think an ant has 50,000 neurons, if I remember right. Um, and, uh, you know, by the time you're even at an ant, you're at a just absurdly huge number of possible combinations. And so the, you know, the, 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 con the, the thoughts of the ant are already far greater than, um, uh, than you can sort of expect to enumerate. Okay, let's see. Uh, questions here. Well, there's a specific one from David. Uh, did I ever meet Isaac Asimov and or Arthur C. Clarke? Unfortunately, I neither met, I, I never met either of those two. Um, I, I, I knew uh, uh, Isaac Asimov was uh, lived in Boston, actually. Um, and uh, I certainly could have met him, although by the time I was sort of out and about and we had a, quite a lot of mutual acquaintances, he tended to very much be a, uh, uh, just like everybody is, but during this pandemic, somebody who just hung out at, at home and, and wrote books. Um, he wasn't really an out and about kind of person. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke, um, I certainly exchanged letters with, um, and uh, uh, I never met him. Um, I think I, yeah, I think we, we, we talked once, um, but uh, uh, he lived uh, the last many years of his life in Sri Lanka, um, which is not a place that I've been to. So I didn't have a chance to, uh, to meet him in person. Um, but uh, he was also very, uh, t t in my interactions with him, a very, a very positive person. Um, let's see. Uh, all kinds of interesting questions here. Let's go back a little bit. Um, uh, okay, there's a question from Alan. Water evaporates from the ocean and moves up. The water doesn't spread uniformly over the sky. Water vapor coalesces into discrete clouds. Why is that? How come the humidity inside a cloud is 100% and right next to it is practically zero? Oh, you're giving me interesting, difficult questions. Well, hmm. Let's see how well I can do on that. Uh, the most relevant thing to say, yeah. Okay, so first point is, when, when water evaporates into the atmosphere, the atmosphere is not completely uniform. There are always air currents, you know, wind, there are always, there's always convection where hot air is rising, cold air is falling, things like that. It's not completely uniform. So there will be some parts in which there's, uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, the humid air is being pulled up higher and will then cool off more and coming down in some other place there's a whole sort of dynamic process of, of how things are moving around. Now water and uh, uh, the sort of interaction between water and air is pretty complicated. Um, and uh, the, the properties of humid air are uh, air, okay, so, so air has certain properties associated with being it's a, a gas where, for example, if you heat air up, it expands. Um, if you and if you if you increase pressure, I mean, there's a formula, the so-called gas laws, that say for a, for an ideal gas. So an ideal gas is a gas where basically there's a lot of space between molecules. And so in a first approximation, what's happening in, for example, the air, which is pretty close to an ideal gas, is the um, uh, the molecules are just all they're doing is just hitting each other like hard billiard balls or something. They're not. They don't have a force of attraction between them that's important. All that's important is when they run into each other, they bounce off. And in a gas that has that form, there's a definite relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature. So temperature of a gas is basically the speed with which all these, all these molecules are bouncing around. The pressure of the gas is kind of, if you have a bunch of these molecules in a box, how many of them are going to hit the wall and bounce off? Because pressure comes from a molecule bouncing off the wall of the thing that you're trying to, that you're using to measure the pressure. Because when it bounces off, it's like, like anything where, where, it, where it hits the wall, it pushes the wall a bit as it bounces off. And that pushing, that force associated with it pushing the wall, that's what leads to pressure. And then volume is just how big is the box that you're putting the gas into. So the sort of the big law of the big gas law discovered in the 1600s um, is uh, PV equals a constant times T. Uh, pressure times volume equals a constant times absolute temperature. Um, so that, um, and that's what's true for an ideal gas, a gas where all that happens is, is uh, atoms 
run into each other. Now, uh, you know, there are effects that don't happen in an ideal gas. For instance, uh, well, when, when in, in a real gas, molecules, uh, it, it's not quite as easy to pull molecules apart as you might think. The, the molecules have a certain force of attraction between them and so on. And that leads to important effects. And in the end, what that leads to is the possibility that the gas, when you cool it down enough, will turn into a liquid. Because if it wasn't for the fact that there were forces pulling these molecules together, the thing wouldn't condense into a liquid. Okay, so what happens in, in, uh, in the case of, so that's sort of the ideal gas law. When you mix uh, air with water, water vapor, the whole thing becomes vastly more complicated. And there's these, this thing called the phase diagram, which is a diagram that shows uh, uh, the um, uh, usually uh, volume versus temperature. It's the most common phase diagram. Is that right? Yes. Um, and um, yeah, this is about to get quite complicated. Okay. so. So among the complicated issues is, uh, hmm. okay, so for water, okay, okay. The, okay, so water exists as a liquid. Water also exists as a gas, steam. Usually we're used to the idea that as you increase the temperature of water, you boil your water, the water goes from being a liquid to being a gas. Okay, all straightforward, okay. Now it turns out that as you change the temperature of, uh, I'm sorry, as you change the pressure of water, there comes a point in this phase diagram that's the so-called critical point of water. And at the critical point, the, the line that sort of separates liquid from gas is no longer distinct. So you, you get into this state where, where there's sort of a, you can't really tell if it's a liquid or a gas. And at that point, there are all kinds of interesting effects that happen. So one thing that happens is that effectively you get sort of droplets of all sizes. And that's kind of why you can't tell if it's a liquid or a gas. It's kind of got liquid droplets and they're of all sizes, but also they're kind of all floating around freely and so it's a gas. And there are all kinds of, of, of features of, of water at the critical point. Um, one thing is that uh, there are, well, there are features on all scales and it's a, it's a thing very much liked by, by theoretical physicists because there's very elegant mathematical theory of, of scale invariance associated with it. You change the scale at which you're looking at it. You know, you see droplets of different sizes on any scale that you look at it. That's, that's kind of what's happening in clouds. And one of the reasons clouds are white is because of this phenomenon of um, uh, the, that it's water at the critical point. Now, the, the, why, am I, why am I yakking on about this? The reason is, the formation of clouds is associated with, I mean, it's a sort of complicated relationship between the properties of water vapor interacting with air and what that means as, as the cloud forms, how that affects things like the temperature, pressure, volume of, of the air. And um, uh, there's, there's quite a bit that is not understood about the formation of clouds. I should, should explain this. Um, and you know, they're different kinds of clouds. So, so for example, a typical thing that happens in a cumulus cloud, the fluffy clouds that happen at like 10,000 feet or something, fa fairly, fairly low or, or less than that, fairly, fairly low clouds. Um, the, the typical thing that's happening there um, is uh, that there, are, uh, there is convection. So there, that means that there's hot air rising, cold air falling, and that is, is bringing the, what does it do? It brings the water vapor up to the point where it has cooled to the critical point. And I think that's where the cloud forms. And the base of the cloud is where, the, where, where you reach the critical point for water, I think. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, um, uh, and, and anyway, so that, that the, the, you know, cumulus clouds are associated with this sort of updraft and downdraft and cirrus clouds, which happen at much higher altitudes um, are a, a um, uh, somewhat different phenomenon. Now, now there are, oh, gosh, there are so many complicated things here and much that I don't know about. Um, one of the questions is, uh, you know, what causes a cloud to form in a particular place? And so there's a whole discussion about, can you seed clouds? 
let's say you want it to rain. You don't want it to rain. You're putting on a giant sports event. You're putting on the Olympics or something. Do you want to make sure it doesn't rain over the Olympics? Can you, can you, you, know, can you fix the atmosphere so that that doesn't happen? So there's been a long discussion about what you can do along those lines. And there's a long discussion about what causes a cloud or droplets in a cloud to form in a particular place. And there's a question of whether the droplets require kind of a seed to form, whether there's a, a grain of dust, whether there might be something that is a leftover thing from, from a lightning storm or something, or a leftover ion or something like this, that, um, uh, that is the sort of the seed that allows a droplet to form in a particular place. And so one of the things that, that has been experimented with for more than 50 years now is this thing called cloud seeding, where typically you have a plane fly over and it, it, it drops out a bunch of, I think silver iodide, I think is one of the substances that, that's used, is that right? Um, and uh, the, um, it doesn't sound right actually. The, anyway, there's some, some, something that you, um, uh, that you use as a, as a kind of seeding agent where you've got little tiny, uh, tiny grains of this. And the idea is that those form sort of nucleation centers for water drops that will then turn into a cloud. Now, you know, once you have a cloud, there's a question of, is it going to rain? And, you know, to what extent does the, does the, the, the drops of water get kind of uh, kept up in the, kept aloft by, by, for example, updrafts of air and things like this, and, and what makes them sort of fall out of the sky? And, and what tends to happen is in, in a cloud, the, um, the water drops, uh, first of all, they, they sort of gain in size by just condensation of water. So, so, you know, you've got a water drop and if the cloud is, I guess, cold enough, you will get um, uh, the, the, there'll just be more water vapor that uh, goes from steam to liquid water to make a bigger drop. And at some point the drop gets heavy enough that it can no longer get sort of held up by the updraft of air um, that's sort of uh, keeping the cloud in place. And so eventually the water drop will fall out of the cloud and then it falls as rain. But the thing that tends to happen is that this, there comes a critical size, I have a vague recollection, it's 18 microns, but I might be wrong, um, where, where, the, um, uh, where the drops are big enough that they no longer grow that they, that they start running into each other and they start accumulating to the point. So, so the eventual way that raindrops get bigger is because the raindrops run into each other and uh, you know, lots of small drops turn into a big drop. So first of all, they form by condensation, just, just water vapor forming onto a single drop and then the drops start running into each other and eventually they get big enough and they fall out of the cloud and they fall as rain. Um, but uh, uh, that's some... Um, and, and I know it, it certainly used to be the case, I, I have not checked into this in uh, probably a couple of decades now. It used to be the case that it was very mysterious how you could go from kind of a cloudless sky to having a cloud that was actually raining in a matter of 15 minutes. That it wasn't very well understood how you get sort of drops that are big enough to form in the cloud in order for that to happen. Um, so a little bit, little bit complicated and lots of things I actually don't know um, about, uh, about how that all works. It's, it's always a big issue. The, the, the modeling of clouds is a, is a complicated issue. When people try to make climate models, for example, um, clouds are one of the, one of the most uncertain things of, of how will clouds be formed? How many clouds are there going to be? What effect will the clouds have? Clouds are difficult. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, you know, it's partly because of this whole interaction between the properties of air and the properties of, 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 of uh, water vapor and so on. But clouds are, you know, if, if, if you run into people who say, I know how to model the climate, I'm going to be able to figure out everything about the future of climate on the earth. You say, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a good question to ask to what extent you manage to, to capture what happens with clouds, because clouds are pretty important. I mean, clouds are not only do they affect the amount of, um, uh, for example, they reflect sunlight back, they affect the amount of sunlight that reaches the ground, they affect a lot of things about the circulation of air and, and so on, and uh, they're, they're, they're complicated um, and, and not uh, completely well understood. All right, let's see. Um, there's a question here. Oh boy, there's a question here about the movie, The Matrix. You know, the problem with these movies is I see them once, I think they're cool, I have a decent memory, but I don't watch them again. So I, you know, my, my sort of, my, 
my my memory of these things probably decays over time. I think that um, uh, the matrix, it's sort of, um, I found it um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, you can ask the question if you're going to try and explain a bunch of philosophical issues, you know, what's the right packaging to explain those issues? It was a pretty cool piece of packaging to explain a bunch of those issues. I mean, I kind of wonder in the in the later Matrix movies, I I I, I did wonder, and I have never really tried to find this out, whether the um, uh, the, the the people who um, uh, who created the Matrix knew about a bunch of science that I've done, because there were definitely aspects of particularly the the end of the whole thing about the the source and the I forget sort of the construction of the universe. That seemed awfully reminiscent of of, um, uh, of things that um, uh, that I was figuring out in the 1980s and so on. But I, I don't know whether there was a, a causal connection between these things. Um, you know, I think that the uh, um, as kind of a metaphor, well, uh, as um, um, you know, I, I think this whole question of um, uh, sort of the relationship between sort of the um, uh, sort of the pure humans and us as humans and kind of the digital world. And I mean, there's, there's this whole issue of, of uh, uh, which I think the matrix to some extent explores and I, I must admit my memory of exactly uh, of exactly what, how it explored it is, is a little bit fuzzy, but um, uh, these questions, which means like the, there's, there's no need for a spoiler alert because I don't remember enough of the story to be able to spoil anything. But um, uh, the, um, um, uh, this whole question about to what extent uh, sort of humans do what they do with free will, to what extent uh, we are kind of determined by the laws of physics, for example, to do what we do, to what extent uh, that is equivalent to being determined by sort of computational laws. Now, you know, in the work that I've done on sort of the relationship between physics and computation, and particularly recently understanding a lot about the fundamental theory of physics, we're coming to realize that yes, our universe is just sort of a giant computation that's happening. The, you know, all the, the progress of time in our universe is just the execution of a big computation. And we are part of that computation and all the things we do are represented by part of that computation. Now, the thing that you might say, well, that's really a, a very depressing outcome because it's like, well, all we're doing is just being part of some big completely determined computation. But the thing that kind of gets you out of that box is this phenomenon I call computational irreducibility, um, which is the fact that even though you know the rules by which the thing operates, if you want to know what's going to happen after a billion steps of running those rules, there's no way to know that other than by basically running those billion steps. So in other words, we don't get to jump ahead and say, so the outcome of our lives is X. It's we still have to sort of live our lives to understand that outcome or to, to know that outcome. And I think, I think the matrix actually did have some, some kind of computational irreducibility thinking in it, which, which I'm kind of guessing would have come from, from things I wrote in the 1980s, but who, who knows? Um, it's it's uh, computational irreducibility, the idea of computational irreducibility, the idea you can kind of know the rules for something and not be able to sort of predict more efficiently than the thing itself, what's going to happen that is an idea that, that in a sense, is, is really originated with things like Gödel's theorem in mathematics in 1931, things like the halting problem in, in Turing machines and theory of computation with Alan Turing in 1936. But it was not really understood as a thing that was relevant to physics until stuff I was doing in the 1980s and so on. It was always thought to be something that was, well, it's relevant to these computational systems, mathematical systems, but that's different from what happens in, in the real world and in, in the physical world and so on. So I think that that's some, uh, but computational irreducibility is a, is a very, uh, uh, you know, if, if there is one thing that comes out of a lot of the sort of fundamental thinking that for example, I've, I've done about how computation works it's this phenomenon of computational irreducibility. It, it, it is the ultimate limiter on science. That is, you know, when we when we do science, we think we're going to find out the fundamental rules of, of a thing in the universe. And then once we found out the fundamental rules, we might think, then we're done. You know, once we know the rules for water vapor and this and that and the other, then we can compute the, what's going to happen to the climate on the earth or something. But it isn't true. And it's it's in fact one of the sort of fallacies of modern science the last probably three to 500 years, people have kind of gotten this idea what science is all about 
is kind of drilling down and finding these fundamental rules, and then we're, we're done. Then we can figure out everything. Science can give us all the answers. What computational reducibility shows us is that that's not the case. From within science itself, there are fundamental limitations. The actual systems in science are ones where there is no way to predict what they're going to do other than by essentially running them and seeing what happens. And that's a consequence of this thing I call the principle of computational equivalence. But it's, it's also that phenomenon is this phenomenon of computational irreducibility. So what, what is to me interesting in terms of the sort of flow of history of science is you know, what we learned from Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, and so on was really this idea that uh, you know, we could have these rules in science, these, these theories of science, which would let us with, with, from this theory predict all this stuff. And we just kind of have made this implicit assumption. That means we can predict everything and it isn't true. Science from within itself has this built-in limitation that prevents certain things from being predictable and requires that you basically just run them and see what happens. And I think that's an important thing to understand. It's important not only in understanding science, but also in understanding things about sort of the, uh, what, what it means for artificial intelligence and what it means for the predictability of that and what it means for whether we can say, you know, can we tell that the AIs are always going to uh, be good to us or something? Well, no, because of computational irreducibility, basically. Anyway, long, long story. Um, there's a question here about um, uh, my thoughts on recent superconductor breakthrough. Yes, I, I noticed that. I have not studied it. I, I don't know. Um, and uh, I mean, the, yeah. Um, uh, I could, let me explain what superconductors are just for people, for people's interest. Um, so when you have a wire, electrical wire, you try and push electricity through it. You have a voltage. The voltage is kind of the, the force that's pushing electrons through the wire. The, in a typical wire, like a copper wire or something, the electrons go through pretty well, but there's still some resistance to the electrons going through. That leads to resistivity in the wire. That means that even though you're pushing, pushing, pushing with a certain voltage to get these electrons to go through the wire, the current, the rate at which electrons go through the wire, is, is limited, there's sort of pushback from the structure of the crystal lattice. And what's happening is the electrons are trying to go through this, uh, this arrangement of copper atoms and they're roughly, some of the electrons are roughly sort of floating between copper atoms and just being able to get through, but it doesn't quite work precisely like that. There is some resistance that exists to the, to the flow of electrons through the copper wire. So a thing that was discovered in the uh, uh, first decade of the, of the 20th century was a phenomenon called superconductivity. If you cool certain wires down far enough, I think lead and niobium were early ones that were discovered. If you cool the wires down to a low enough temperature, the, their resistance, the resistance to the electrons goes down and down, 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 down. And then suddenly at a critical temperature, the resistance to pushing electrons through the wire goes to zero not just small, but actually zero. Electrons, you put a little, a tiny, a, a tiniest voltage you can imagine on the wire and electrons will just be pushed through it as fast as you want, or as, as, as many as you want. Um, so that's the phenomenon of superconductivity. And once you have a superconducting wire, you can, uh, you can get a current to flow through that superconducting wire. Uh, you can get lots of current to flow through and there's no, there's no resistance. Why is resistance important? So let's say you're trying to, uh, you've got an electrical power, electric power station, and it's generating lots of, lots of electricity, and you want to transfer that electricity to some place that's a thousand miles away. Well, you put it through a wire, but there's a resistance to getting that, that electricity through the wire. And that resistance to when you, what, what, what actually happens is that the, 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 the sort of the force you try and push things through with doesn't succeed in getting all the electricity through. Um, instead, some of that force is just turning into heat. It's not successfully pushing electrons through, it's just turning into heat. And so when you see electrical wires, turns out the higher the voltage that you're using, the less, uh, compared to the amount of current you're getting through, the, the, the less heat you produce. Um, but um, 
it's, it's still the case that you can't get rid of the heat that you're producing unless the wire is superconducting. If the wire is superconducting, um, then the resistance to pushing the electron through is zero. No heat is generated by getting the electrons to go through the wire. Now, in um, uh, the, um, uh, there's a little bit of a catch, which is that superconductors typically, if you try and put too much current through them, the current produces a magnetic field and the magnetic field actually breaks down the superconductivity. So superconductors usually have both a critical temperature, if you heat them up too much, they stop being superconductors and a critical magnetic field. So basically if you put too much current through the superconductor, it stops being a superconductor anymore. Um, it's, uh, um, uh, okay, the question from flying here. If the resistance goes to zero with the electron start accelerating without bound. Um, it doesn't actually accelerate without bound. I'm a little bit cheating in describing the, um, uh, uh, how this works. The, um, the fuller story, oh boy, can I get to this fuller story? The fuller story has to do with the so-called conduction bands of, um, uh, it's, it's a story of quantum mechanics. And essentially it isn't really right to think about individual electrons being pushed through the wire. What's really true is that there's this kind of delocalized electron field that exists in the wire. And when you're, when you're putting a, a, a voltage, uh, you're, you're, sort of, uh, you're sort of distorting that, that um, electron field. And so it's not really a question of just saying, you know, individual electron go faster, faster, faster. Um, ele electrons go through wires at a, at a fraction, maybe a tenth of the speed of light usually. Um, in some in some sense of measuring that you can you can sort of send a signal through a wire at a certain speed. Um, now, anyway, about superconductors. So, for quite a long time, nobody understood how you could get down to uh, you could get sort of zero resistivity for um, uh, for, for electrons going through a wire. Um, what was realized is that actually the phenomenon of superconductivity is basically the same phenomenon as the phenomenon that causes lasers to work. And, and, and the way lasers work is essentially you've got a bunch of photons and you arrange it so that uh, kind of all the photons in the laser want to do the same thing. They all kind of want to be exactly lined up, exactly in phase so that their uh, uh, light waves are, are all lined up and they want to be going in exactly the same direction, you know, making a laser beam. And, and that, that phenomenon of things wanting to sort of all be in the same state is a phenomenon of quantum mechanics associated with uh, so-called bosons. Uh, certain uh, particles, uh, and this is, gets a little complicated, but particles that have integer spin, um, of which uh, photons are an example, they have spin one, um, uh, like to get in the same state. If you put lots of photons together, they all want to do the same thing. Electrons, which have spin a half, work quite differently. If you try and push lots of electrons into the same state, they exclude each other. There's this thing called the exclusion principle. And that's actually why matter is stable is because of that exclusion principle. Because if there weren't electrons and, and other spin a half particles and so on, matter would just collapse. It's, it's the fact that there's this sort of exclusion of things that prevents these electrons from all sort of occupying the same space and so on that causes matter to, to be stable. But anyway, so, so electricity is made of electrons. So there's a question of, can you get something like the laser case where, where in the laser case, these, are, these photons are all sort of ganging up together. And so they, they kind of have, if, if there was a question of resistance and it doesn't work quite the same way for light, it would be like, they're all in it together and they're all able to sort of push through together and, and, and overcome that, that sort of resistance. Um, I think that the, um, uh, the question of um, uh, what, um, uh, so, so okay, how does that work for, for electrons, which like to exclude things, like to not be in the same state, was discovered in the 1950s or 60s, I think. Uh, what actually happens in superconductors is a thing, the formation of these things called Cooper pairs, which are places where pairs of electrons have paired up. And so the electron has spin a half, but these pairs have, for example, spin zero, um, because it's like a half minus a half gives you zero. Um, and it's the, these pairs of electrons that allow you to get superconductivity. Now there's a question of, okay, can we make a superconductor 
the, the big question is, can we make a superconductor that works at room temperature? Most superconductors work only a few degrees above absolute zero at temperatures of liquid helium and things like this. Um, so they're very, you know, they only work in very, very cold temperatures. Can we get a superconductor that will work at something like room temperature um, so that we could use it in practical kinds of things that we're, we're doing in, in sort of typical everyday settings? And that's been a big adventure to try and find high temperature superconductors. There was a, about 30 years ago, people found uh, a, a set of materials that have very, very exotic materials with elements like lanthanum in them and so on, a uh, whole uh, sort of weird, weird materials that uh, are high temperature superconductors. But by high temperature, it means, uh, you know, maybe 100 degrees above absolute zero, not uh, reaching kind of room temperature, which is uh, 300 degrees above absolute zero. So the thing that, um, uh, um, so there's been this kind of big hunt on for, can one find a material that will make a high temperature superconductor? The theory of how even the high temperature and quotes high temperature superconductors that exist today work is, is really quite incomplete. Um, so there's this sort of this question of, is there a way to find a material which by some weird feature of the way that it interacts with electrons and the way that this and that happens manages to make a superconductor at room temperature? And, and uh, there's been some recent progress, which I really have not studied in the last couple of weeks on this. Um, and uh, uh, you know, this is a challenge. If it is successful, it will lead to all kinds of cool things. I mean, you know, the magnets that exist today, back in the day, most people just had iron magnets. But in the last probably 20, 30 years, so-called rare earth magnets made with, uh, with elements like gadolinium and so on have become pretty common. And rare earth magnets, uh, are much stronger than ordinary, you know, usually the, the, the magnetic uh, elements are, are iron, cobalt, nickel, um, but there are other elements that are sort of below them on the periodic table, like gadolinium. Um, I think samarium maybe is another one, but gadolinium is the most common one that's used for this, um, that have kind of much stronger magnetism. And so a lot of magnets that you'll find a lot of uh, modern sort of consumer electronics devices are rare earth magnets, gadolinium magnets, and things like that. Um, and uh, if we had superconductors at room temperature, we would have all kinds of interesting, uh, oh, I should say that as soon as you have a superconductor, you can kind of make this loop of wire. And when you have a loop of wire with a current going around it, that makes a magnetic field. So you can, you can use this to make magnets. You can use it to transmit electricity easily. You can use it for all kinds of purposes. Um, and you know, once you have a, a superconductor, and you have a current going around a, a, a superconductor, it will go around for months at a time. It, it, it really doesn't, there really is no resistance to motion. All right, we should wrap up uh, quite, quite soon here. Ah, D, DVL is saying uh, it's their birthday. Happy birthday to, I can't read your, your, um, uh, uh, your handle here, but, but uh, DVL something. Um, uh, I'm, um, yeah. It's always, um, yeah. Well, happy birthday anyway. Um, let's see, there may be one more question here. Oh, boy. There's a question. Um, Ah, the, the login was devil or angel. Okay, that's interesting. Well, happy birthday, devil or angel. Um, hmm. That's an interesting question. All right, I'm gonna do maybe two more here. It's a question from Cambridge. Um, why doesn't every single thought episode last forever? Why does thought disappear after it arises? Why does... Why does our memory, for example, decay? When we, when we think about something, why are we not kind of, why is that not sort of permanently etched in our brains, so to speak? Why does it decay away? I mean, we don't know completely how, so, so in a first approximation, our brains are working with electrical impulses in our neurons. And once an electrical signal, when, when a neuron has transmitted an electrical signal to another neuron, then 
it's gone, so to speak. That that electrical signal is is then transmitted on to the next neuron, and it's it's disappeared. But the question is, uh, you know, is there a memory of what that signal was? Um, and the answer is, uh, well, probably not that we can access. But some signals, for whatever reason, uh, lead to a sort of permanent memory, and and, and there are various detailed theories about how this happens. And it's becoming clear that, that some of what happens in artificial neural nets is actually closer to the way it works in real brains than we thought. But in a first approximation, the, um, uh, there are you know, memories are formed in the synapses and the connections between neurons, it seems. And uh, there are uh, things that are, uh, usually there's a sort of short-term memory that arises from, from particular proteins being produced um, in those uh, uh, in those synapses, I think the longer term memories end up being actual pores, actual channels that exist in the neurons, uh, calcium channels, things like that. It's almost like a little tiny, tiny piece of rock that is being being sort of uh, uh, created in the that 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 uh, uh, is opening up or not or not opening up the ability of um, of these uh, connections between neurons to exist. Um, so. Uh, there's sort of the, and, and the, there's then the question of if we have a memory and we've had a memory for 10 years, how does that memory go away? How does that memory get erased? We don't really know the answer to that. One possibility is it's kind of like computer memory. We just use that piece of memory again. That neuron, sorry, that neuron, which was the original neuron that was used to learn some word in French when you were a kid, is now being reused to be. Uh, the thing that you are, uh, uh, that is remembering something about some movie you just saw. That's a possibility that it's just being reused, that our brains just don't have enough space to store everything that they need to store and that we're just gonna reuse pieces of storage space, so to speak, that's a possibility. Another possibility is that gradually chemical processes degrade whatever it is that, that maintains memory in a particular neuron. Another possibility is the neuron just dies um, we know that um, uh, from from the, the uh, when uh, when one's born, there is a certain rate at which neurons die. It used to be thought that that you're kind of you're born with all the neurons you're ever going to get, and neurons just die, and no new neurons are born. It became clear about 20 years ago now that no, actually, new neurons can be created in in human brains, in adult brains, for example. So it's it's sort of not all over. It's not all downhill from the time you're born. You can get new neurons. Now, presumably a new neuron, once it exists, doesn't remember anything, it doesn't know anything. If an old neuron that remembered something dies, then you presumably lose those memories. Um, although it's a slightly more complicated story because all these neurons are connected to all these other neurons. And it's the, it's the sort of whole network of connections that presumably is responsible for, for storing the memories that we have. Let's see, one, one last question here, I think. Um, Huh. It's a question for, from Anonymous. How do you get your staff to get so much done, especially so much hard stuff? Um, gosh. Well, look, the first thing about getting hard stuff done is you have to believe it's possible. And, you know, if there's nobody involved who believes it's possible, it's not going to happen. So at some point, you have to, if you're leading a group of people, it's kind of like, look, this is a thing, it's worth doing, and it's possible, even though it may seem very, very hard, even though it's like, no, we can't do this, it's way too difficult, way too little time, way too hard, you know, people have been trying to do that for a long time, can't be done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think the first thing is, so the zero thing is, you have to believe it yourself, because if you don't believe it's possible yourself, it's going to be very hard to communicate to other people, yes, this is possible, we can really do this. I think that the, another feature of, of working with other people, and I, I've had the, the good fortune, I suppose, to, to work with lots of very talented people over the course of many decades now. Um, you know, it's, it's I, I would say that there are uh, sort of a, a, you know, finding talented people and then finding talented people who are a fit with your style of doing things. I mean, I, I know that um, there are lots of talented people where I'd say, that's a fantastic person. They're going to do fantastic things, but they'll go crazy working at our company. 
and we'll go crazy with them. And um, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something where there's a certain sort of fit that's needed uh, to work with people. Now, I think one of the things that's really nice about our company, for example, is we have a, a very great diversity of, of uh, types of people and personalities and so on. And I, I guess I pride myself, I don't know really how, how, how much I should pride myself on this, but I, I think I pride, I, I pride myself on being able to work with lots of different kinds of personalities and being able to, uh, to help people sort of do the best work they can um, uh, you know, with a, with a whole diversity of, of very optimistic personalities, very pessimistic personalities, very uh, sort of uh, people who sort of do everything they're told, people who never do what they're told, people who, you know, just a, a range of different kinds of, um, uh, kinds of personalities. And I think the, the trick really is in doing a project, it's like you've got a project, you imagine this project has, has got to be done. Now you've got a pool of people it's like, how do you solve the puzzle of how do these different people fit into the project that you're trying to do? And I think that's a thing that is, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting problem. It's kind of the, the, the uh, I see it as being sort of a core problem managing people and projects and so on is, is to do that sort of matching. And it's not the case. You say, I've got this project. Now just, you know, get me a person who fits in this, in this slot. That's that's usually not the, the thing that's going to work. It's usually there's this person and they're you know a puzzle piece of a certain shape, and there's this project and it has a, a, a sort of puzzle piece of a certain shape. How do you fit these things together? And sometimes you redefine the project a little bit. Sometimes you you have to uh, sort of uh, have the person understand how they can fit into this thing that they originally thought. Oh, I don't do things like that. Well, actually, here's the way you think about it, so that you realize you can do things like that. Um, I think those are. Uh, those are those are some types of things. I think also, you know, as in leading projects and leading difficult projects, you kind of have to be able to roll up your sleeves and do a lot of the, the work, uh, you know, at least be in a position to do the work yourself. I mean, it's it's a big trade off for me, for example, you know, I have the sort of the, 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 the misfortune, the good fortune and the misfortune of having by this point, a lot of experience of doing lots of kinds of projects. And it's it's a question of, you know, to what extent should I just do it myself? And to what extent should I delegate it to other people to do? Um, and, you know, that's a complicated trade-off because if it's something where I can do it pretty deterministically in 30 minutes, and if I, if I hand it off to somebody else to do it, it might take them a week, and there might be a chance of, you know, a 30% chance that they don't manage to do it at all. Should I spend the 30 minutes to do it, or should I... Um, uh, should I have that risk and the and the much longer time of somebody else doing it? That's a complicated trade-off because you can't do everything yourself. The great thing about working with people is that it dramatically expands the range and the size and so on of projects that you can do, just because it's just much more much more bandwidth to to get things done. But on the other hand, there's this question of if you can do something more efficiently, you know, when should you do it yourself versus when should you delegate it to other people? It's a complicated thing. And I, I, I spend a lot of effort trying to get that right. I don't always get it right, um, but that's one of the challenging things. I think it's also important for me at least is most things that I can delegate to other people well are things that in principle I could do myself. I might not be able to do it as well as the person I delegate it to, but at least I could do it. It's not something where it's like, I don't understand this at all. I couldn't possibly do it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's, a, that's an important thing. I found that things where, where I'm just like, oh, go do this. I don't really understand how it could possibly be done. That doesn't usually end well. It's if I understand the thing that has to be done, but the person I'm giving it to might be better at doing it than I am, um, then that's, uh, 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 you know, that, that's, a, that's a reasonable handoff. But, you know, it's a... It's a um, uh, it's it's always a, uh, I mean my my staff for better or worse are always telling me who are mostly much younger than me at this point. You know, I, when I was younger, I always used to be working with people who are older than me, and and sometimes that that caused all kinds of problems. And it was I realized this is one of these problems that for better or worse solves itself with time. Um, and now I mostly work with people just demographically who are who are who are younger than me, but. Um, uh, they're, they're often telling me that I, I have a lot of energy and um, I, I've been, I suppose I'm fortunate that still at my sort of ancient age, I still have enough energy to sort of tenaciously do projects for, for long periods of time and so on. And I think that it's, it's um, sort of the, the, uh, 
the the the, the projection of of energy and tenacity about doing projects is really important to get people to you know to do projects. I mean, we, we just did a project that just sort of more or less ended this last Monday, which was a project to investigate um, uh, these things called combinators, which I'm not going to describe in great detail here, but but um, that was sort of a very early, um, perhaps the earliest kind of um, uh, uh, invention of the the sort of the main idea of computation. And they were originated by a, a talk that was given on December 7th, 1920. And so we were, I was very keen. I'd, I'd had this in my, in my calendar for like years to, um, to sort of celebrate that, that centenary. Um, and so we were, we were really keen to, I was really keen to sort of figure out a bunch of things technically about combinators, figure out a bunch of things about the history of, of how they came to be invented. Um, and we had a very definite deadline, which was Monday of this week. Um, where we did a sort of event about these things, um, and uh, that was a that was a bit of a struggle because that was a was a project where we really had no sense of scope. It wasn't clear how much could be discovered about combinators. It wasn't clear how difficult the history was, how much could be discovered in the history, and so on. And we started oh I don't know probably six weeks ago or something now working on this, and it became clear that there was a lot to do. I mean a lot a lot to do, and um, in the end I I ended up writing probably. 350 pages or something of material about combinators and their history. Um, and that all had to be finished by Monday morning. And I, I will say that that was, uh, uh, even for me, that was, uh, and I, I tend to do difficult projects and I tend to do them in, in sort of extreme, um, uh, um, uh, perhaps extreme ways. That was for me a little bit on the, on the, uh, on the extreme end of extreme projects, so to speak, just in terms of, you know, I had originally thought, oh, this is going to be a, you know, a short thing of a few tens of pages and so on, not a 350 page monstrosity full of, full of a bunch of new research, both on the technical side and the historical side, but it was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, uh, it's, um, uh, I'm glad, I'm glad I had a chance to do it. And I'm also glad in a sense there was a deadline for it because, uh, uh, that that has caused it to get done. Uh, it's got a little bit of trailing stuff that has to happen. Actually, I need to get going now because we have another intense project, which is that we are about to release the new version of Wolfram Language, and it's my job to uh, uh, to write a sort of essay about it. And I just started that earlier today, and I have an intense next few days um, putting together um, all the aspects of that. And I think I better go back to... Um, uh, to working on that now. But um, anyway, nice to be with you guys for a little while um, and um, uh, look forward to um, going on um, uh, next week. See you then. <laughs>